morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all here with us online again. And welcome Terry Metkin, who is going to talk about an amazing session today as well. So, hi, Terry, how are you? Hello, I am well, thank you. Yeah, I'm really well. Surprised it's so far into 2022 already. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's, the, the year is blasting by already, but I am doing brilliantly. Thank you. Yes, that sounds good and so happy to hear it. You know, we have met already um, last year already, and uh, then we talked a lot about what you're doing and what is your passion. And maybe it, our audience already remember that you're also a Microsoft AI MVP and you're passionate about using traditional software engineering techniques for data. Uh, solutions to improve um, how to deliver machine learning projects. That sounds really amazing. Do you use a lot of uh, Databricks? That is your main uh, sessions about at AI42. <laughs> yes, yeah. So yeah, so as a company, we do uh, a, a whole amount, like pretty much everything we do is very Spark based, um, be that on Databricks or Synapse or just Spark in general. Um, but yeah, all, all of that stuff, pretty much everything we do nowadays is Spark and helping customers kind of understand how you work with Spark and machine learning in a distribution and how you kind of get the best, the best out of all of those tools. Yes, because these are pretty amazing tools, right? So yeah, they're, they're great. They're one of these though, because it's it's such a different paradigm shift to what a lot of people are are used to. If you just take them at their face value, um, it can it can look very easy, but you can really quickly get into nasty performance problems that you just wouldn't be aware of because things under the hood are just so different to when you're working on a single machine compared to a distribution. So um, there's all like a, a whole new set of challenges to to tackle, really. Yes, and it really sounds amazing. And I can't wait to hear what you're coming up with today. Before we go forward, um, I would like to tell a few words about what is AI42, and then we will come back to you so you can tell more about how Spark is making our life easier. Good stuff. So hi and welcome everyone. Again, I'm very happy that I can welcome all of you at the session of AI42. The motivation for starting AI42 comes from the recognition that there is no good starting material. And AI42 is a strong team consisting of three Microsoft AI MVPs that strive to provide you with a valuable series of lectures that will help you jumpstart your career in data science and AI. AI42 aims to provide you with the necessary know-how that can help you land your dream job as long as it is related to data science or machine learning. And the concept is really simple. It involves professionals from all around the globe explaining you the underlying mathematics, statistics, probability calculations, data science, and machine learning techniques. And we will guide you through. All you have to do is to follow our channel and enjoy the content every second week filled with real life cases and expert experiences. And you don't need to worry. We will start from scratch, but that's how all started. And we are very happy to build it up from there. You can always stop and rewind the videos or ask for clarification in the comment section. And we really hope to assist you on this wonderful journey and have you as a speaker one day. By creating cross collaborations with other organizations, we can give the best opportunities to broaden your network in the AI and data science communities. So with the combination of our offered services, we would support less fortunate people and organizations that are not that recognized yet, even though they would reserve it. And our organization is sponsored by Microsoft and Miles. We are really humbled by all the support we get from our contributors as well. Thank you, Levante Pongor, for all the beautiful graphical content and Mina Marie for the cool intro music before our event. We are also in close collaboration with C Sharp Corner and Global AI Community. So our lectures are going to be available also on their YouTube channel, additionally to our own media. 
and Nicolas Tourt creates and reviews all our text content we use on our website or advertisements and during our sessions. Please go ahead and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter to become a part of this growing community where we will share knowledge and fun. You will find every information that will bring you to an advanced level in the field of AI and data science. You can watch our recorded sessions on YouTube and you can find our upcoming sessions on our meetup page. The Code of Conduct outlines expectations for participating in our community as well as steps for reporting unacceptable behavior. We are committed to providing a welcoming and inspiring community for all. So please be friendly and be patient, be welcoming and be respectful, respectful for each other. Read more about our code of conduct on this uh, web page, please. So I think with that, let's go back to our speaker. Hello. Hi, Terry. It's nice to see you back. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know that we have met already, and we already know that this is going to be the second part of that session where yep. we were talking about advanced analytics using Apache Spark in Azure Databricks. And yep. today we are going to talk about graph-based analytics. Can you tell a few words what we are going to hear about today? Yeah, absolutely. So last time, last time I was on, we were looking at how Spark and how Databricks kind of implement um, a variety of different ways of you doing advanced analytics. And we focus more on machine learning. This time around, what we're going to look at is how you can execute graph-based processing. And so graph-based processing is fantastic where you've got highly connected data. Um, and what you want to do is reshape that in a format that really suits that way of thinking. And so we'll go through that. We'll go through a bit about the theory, where it came from, and then we'll look at some practical implementations in Databricks using Spark. That sounds really exciting. And before I give you the microphone over, I would like to mention to the audience that please feel free to ask your questions in the chat so if we can raise these questions in the end of the session so Terry can answer them. And I think with that, we are ready to go. Terry, the stage is yours. Good luck. Thank you very much. OK, fantastic. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody watching um, at home and across the world. So as mentioned, right, what we're going to do today is look at graph based processing in Apache Spark. And off we go. So um, as I mentioned, my name's Terry McCann. Um, I run a company in the UK um, called Advancing Analytics. And we are a data analytics consultancy specializing in um, engineering and also in machine learning and AI and anything essentially advanced analytics. Um, it's worth calling out that we have a YouTube um, channel where we're constantly putting different videos about Apache Spark and about pretty much anything related to advanced analytics on the Azure platform. There's a couple of videos um, which are worth checking out on here, particularly that kind of reinforce a lot of the topics that we're going to talk about. You can see one of them on here, which is about graph theory and centrality. Um, and then we have another kind of higher level introduction to um, graph theory. So do check those out. Little bits about me. Um, I've been doing this for um, for a decent amount of time now. I haven't updated this slide for about three years, so you can just add numbers on. Um, but yeah, as mentioned, I'm an AI MVP, which pretty much just means I spend um, a lot of my time doing talks like this, and probably not enough time doing real work. If you ask, um, if you ask the team. So, what are we going to look at then in detail today? So, we're going to look at what graph processing is. We're going to look at some of the theory and we're going to talk about um, nodes, edges, and we're going to delve in to some of the processes and in particular, an interesting approach called ASCII based um, matching. And then finally, we're going to understand why graph processing is a big deal and how it will change the way that you potentially work with highly connected data. OK, so what is a graph database, right? You might be thinking that we're here to talk about stuff like this, right? We're looking at graphs, and that's not quite why we are here. You can visualize what we're going to talk about in a graph. However, what we're looking at is a process called graph-based processing or property graphs, 
which end up looking something a bit more like this. We are looking at how we reshape data into a slightly different format so that the connections between it are inherently known um, and implied in the structure. They are explicitly programmed as part of our structure. And we'll have a look at what that means in a load of detail. Now, with anything, and I think particularly for this channel, it works well to talk a little bit about the history of graph-based processing and where it came from and kind of how we've arrived at the, at the gosh, the plethora of different options that you have. Um, so it all kind of starts here. It starts in a, a place called Konersberg. Now, if you've done an undergraduate in maths or physics, you will undoubtedly be aware of the Konersberg bridge problem. And the Konersberg bridge problem um, is, is just this, right? There was back in, oh gosh, I think it was the 1400s. Back in the 1400s, there was a mayor of Konersberg. Um, and Konersberg, as you can kind of see in this picture, is um, you've got a kind of north bank, a south bank, and you've got two islands in the middle. And what the mayor was, as well as being the mayor, he was a kind of keen mathematician. And he knew that he, well, what he wanted to do was he wanted to try to cross each of the seven bridges, only crossing each one once. Now, he kind of was like struggling with this and trying to work out how he could solve it. And I, I wanted to take a moment and give you an opportunity to try and solve it yourself, right? So how can you go through crossing all of these different bridges only once to make it across each one, right? Could you kind of start, you know, down on the bottom and hop over here and cross back over and loop back around, right? What, what are the options that you have? I'm not sure if you've got my awful music in the background. Um, but who, who solved it? Anybody put in the comments if you solved it? I'm seeing no comments. And that, that's largely because this problem has no solution, okay? There is no way that you can start and cross each one of these land masses only crossing each bridge once. And now the mayor knew that he couldn't do this, but he wanted to know why. Why, why is it that I can't actually do this? What is the... What is the mathematical proof behind this, which indicates why I can't cross each one of these bridges only once, right? And so he tried solving it himself, couldn't quite work it out. And so he wrote to one of the most kind of prominent mathematicians at the time, um, this man, a chap called Leonard Euler. And again, if you've done any mathematics in the past, you'll be completely familiar with the name Euler. Um, Euler has had such a huge impact on mathematics. Lots of things like irrational numbers and other things have come from Euler. Um, and he has, a, a has had a huge impact on mathematics. And so the mayor of Konersberg wrote to Euler and he said, you know, look, this is my problem. This is what I'm trying to do. But I can't quite understand why this doesn't work. And at first, Euler just dismissed it. He thought, you know, this isn't, this isn't you know, something that I should put you know, my enormous brain power behind. This is something quite child play. I'm not interested in doing this. But eventually he revisited the problem and started noticing that there was actually something quite interesting behind it when you when you abstracted yourself kind of away from the problem. And so what Euler did was he looked to kind of take this idea and start trying to break it down into what are the kind of key components really happening here. As mentioned, you've kind of got this north bank, you've got a south bank, and you've got these two islands. Now, Euler tried to simplify that into a picture that looked a bit like this, each one of these dots um, being one of those land masses. Okay? And what Euler did was he came to know these as um, vertices or nodes. Okay? And though, um, Euler would refer to them as vertices. In graph-based processing, they're typically known as nodes or vertices. Okay? And then the connections between those are what were known as edges. And so what we started to see is we started to get a picture that looked a bit like this. We've got those four nodes connected by a number of different edges. And now what you can start doing here is you can start plotting the degrees of centrality. So you can see there we've got five on the left and then we've got three on each. And when we have a structure like this, where we have um, all odd numbers, 
it makes it impossible for us to kind of follow through that process of connecting through each one of these edges only once. It just doesn't work. You need to be able to do something to change that structure to make it so that you could do that. And so as Euler started coming up with these, he started coming up with a number of laws around what happened. And this fundamentally became what is known as um, graph theory. Now, the Konigsberg bridge problem was actually solved, but in a more unfortunate way um, during, I think it was World War I or World War II, um, Konigsberg was actually bombed um, and a number of the bridges were destroyed, solving the Konigsberg bridge problem just not quite in the way that you know anyone had quite intended it to be solved at the time. So as mentioned, a lot of this really underpins what became known as, as graph theory and is you know a subset of mathematics which has lots of interesting um, applications. And so graph theory is kind of where we're starting. And once we've got the understanding of here, we're going to look at how this actually gets applied to our data so that we can start doing interesting things where we've got highly connected relationships. So we've learned a little bit about our graph theory. Now the core things to kind of take away from this are these two things, okay? We've got nodes or vertices, okay? And those are an entity in our graph. Then connecting those are our edges, okay? Um, and an edge is that kind of relationship. So moving on from what is a graph database, we can give it a more formal definition, right? The more formal definition is this. So in computing, a graph database is a database that uses structures for semantic queries with nodes, edges, and properties to represent the store of data. Now we've touched on nodes and we've touched on edges. We haven't mentioned much about properties, but I have mentioned a couple of times property graph. And in a graph-based database, the properties are really important. It's properties that give our graph and give the relationships between nodes and edges importance. It's one thing to know that two things are connected, but it's another to know that they're connected and the strength of the relationship is significant compared to something that is weak. Okay, so the properties really offer the value and I guess you could say the context around that relationship. So graph databases by design allow for um, simple and fast retrieval of complex hierarchical structures that are difficult to model in a relational system. Now that last point is really key, right? What we're saying here is this stuff is difficult to model in a relational database. Now, the worst thing that you can always say to a kind of room of database professionals is, you know, that can't be done in a relational database. Okay, because what you end up doing is I always lose the audience because everyone kind of sits there like, well, actually, I could probably do that. I could do like some recursive CTE. I could do a cursor. Actually, if I programmed it like this, I could get to where what you're saying. And so what I would say is what we're saying is it's not that it can't be done in a relational database, but it's whether or not you should do it in a relational database or whether or not you should actually use a tool that was designed to solve that particular problem. OK. And that's what graph databases are there for. So what's the problem with relational databases, right? So let's take an example like this, okay? What we've got is a movie database and I've got people and I've got movies. And now a person could be an actor or a person could be the director. And where we have this, rather than creating lots of individual tables of actors and of directors and of financers and producers and whoever else is involved in the production of that film, we typically create a person table and we create a movie table and then we create these um, the top bits of actor and director, which are known as relation for relationships. OK, we create a many to many table that connects people and movie, but gives each join um, an, an additional attribute to say, well, they're connected because this person is also a director or an actor or something else. Right. Now, the problem here is that each time you try to scale this, 
you need to add more and more into here. Each time you need to keep adding more and more and more many to many relationships for each time that you need to add on some other kind of relationship. Okay. We also have a problem here, which is known as um, impedance mismatch, which is where potentially a relational database might be the right place to store something, but it might not be. It might actually be the wrong place to store something. And let's take a, a super basic form like this, right, in a very old school looking application where we've got customer information, we've got the terms of purchase, we've got um, line item information, we've got sub information, as well as messaging, okay? We've got a huge amount of information. Now, if you've ever worked with a relational database, you'll be very familiar with seeing potentially thousands of tables which underpin that database. And this would be no exception, right? We'd end up storing these in a variety of different ways. Now, you could argue that we don't need to store them in that way. We could store them in a format that is most suitable for what this purpose is. And you might suggest that actually we could store them in a document database, right? You could store them in something um, slightly different. And so this difference in knowing where to store stuff um, is kind of where we'll start talking about next. So some of the problems are, right, that a relational database can be quite complex to store and model relationships. You would think a relational database, right, that the relational aspect of a relational database relates to how easy it is to make relationships. But really, a, a database has no inherent idea of relationships Sure, you can apply things like foreign keys um, and primary keys to enforce a relationship, but inherently there is no connection between a customer um, and a product, right? There's no way to in inherently see that. You have to know how that is connected. And as you start scaling these things up, they can become more and more complicated. Performance degrades with more data. So the more and more data that we put in, the more and more the performance will start to slow down because what we're trying to do potentially isn't the right shape of query for that particular store. And queries can be long and complex. And there might be a more simpler way to actually solve some of that. And so a lot of kind of thought went into this process. And pretty much starting in the early 2000s, we started seeing a rise of papers coming out from some of the big players from Google, from Amazon, looking at different ways in which we could start storing data that wasn't so focused around relational databases and suggested a different approach, right? And that all really kicked off with two key papers the Google Distributed File System paper and the MapReduce paper, which came a little bit later, which is this one on the screen. And they were talking about a scaled out approach to storing data so that you could take advantage of multiple machines rather than just one machine. From that, we had the um, big table paper as well, talking about another way. And then the last one we had, um, or one of the key ones anyway, was um, DynamoDB. And so what we are looking at here is multiple ways of distributing, distributing your data, as well as storing your data in a format that is more relevant. And so this kind of bought the term um, polyglot persistence. And polyglot persistence is written about a lot um, in a great book by Martin Fowler. This book is it's quite old now, um, but it's a very thin book and it's called No Sequel Distilled. And if you don't want to read the thin book, you can actually just watch a video on YouTube called No Sequel Distilled, Distilled in 60 Minutes. And it's pretty much that whole book and everything you'd want to know about polyglot persistence in about 30 minutes. But what polyglot persistence tells us is to pick the best store for the problem that we have. So if you look at this picture, right, you've got shopping cart and session data. Maybe that is best stored in a, um, a key value store as opposed to a relational database. Completed orders might be stored better in a document store. Inventory and price data, that's perfect relational data, right? Put that in a relational DB. Or where you've got customer interactions and a customer social graph, maybe it's best to put that in a graph store, okay? So 
Relational is fantastic, but Polyglot Persistence tells us to use the right data store for the challenge that we're facing. And if that challenge is highly connected data, then a relational system just might not be the right job, okay? Might not be the right tool for the job. So what is the right tool, right? It's a property graph. You know, that's why we're here. That's what we've been talking about. A property graph potentially is a better option. Now we've seen these, right? Nodes and edges. Now these are the key core building blocks of a property graph. Now the difference that we have here compared to what we saw in Euler's diagram is we have a direction on that arrow, right? Our node and our other node are connected and the connection is directional, okay? Now you can get bidirectional graphs but for a lot of property graphs, the direction is important. And we'll, I'll explain what I mean there in a moment. So moving on, right? An example might be this. One of our nodes is the idea of a person and the other idea is a movie. And we can say that this person acted in a movie, okay? So that's our connection. The connection is that that person has acted in that movie. So let's take an example, right? We've got Robin Williams. Um, Robin Williams acted in the film Jumanji. I'm never sure when I wrote these slides why I picked Jumanji as my film for an example, but I'm always surprised when it comes up. Uh, great film. So Robin Williams acted in the film Jumanji, right? We've got a connection there. Another example might be a person and a directed relationship. Same thing, two nodes, but now the edge is different, okay? So it might be that James Cameron directed the movie Titanic, for example. Or what we could have is something like this, right? Um, we've got entities which become nodes, as we've mentioned. We've got um, foreign keys and um, primary keys will become our edges. So as we're translating from the relational world to the graph world, these are some um, basic rules that we can apply. Many to many relationships will just become edges um, and attributed joins on edges become properties, right? How we give strength to our connections, those are what we're going to use to ultimately enforce our property graph. Okay, so let's take another example, right? A user rated a movie. Now we could leave it like that, or we could say that Ash rated the movie Alien and he rated it a nine. So out of 10, he gives it a nine, right? Now we know somebody interacted with that movie and we know the difference now that somebody really liked that movie, right? So a slightly different way of thinking, but we've reinforced a connection. Now, if we take this example, right, that we saw before, we've got person and we've got movie, they will become our nodes. And then we've got our actor and our director here. So we could take something like um, Ben Affleck, right? Ben Affleck um, and the movie Argo, we can say that, you know, Ben Affleck um, directed the film Argo and also starred in it um, and that he was also a star in the film Batman versus Superman, right? And so now we're able to see the kind of bare bones of what a property graph might look like. Okay, so what about some uses? Where are the actual use cases in structuring our data in this way? So there are three main query types that you will do. You will do something known as a shortest path, where you will look to say, how does it? How many hops does it take me to get from um, A to B? Now, if you're on LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn doesn't do this quite like it used to. But what LinkedIn used to do is you would kind of see yourself um, and you'd look at your connections and it would suggest you new connections. And what it would do is it would do that by looking at you um, and then the back end of LinkedIn um, would go into a property graph and it would step out in your first connections, okay? And it'd look at all your first connections and then it would say, okay, well, going a further step out, who are your first connections connected to that you're not connected to? And then also try to give those some weight. And so each time you kind of just scrolled and scrolled on LinkedIn, it would just keep suggesting you page after page after page after page. And that's because what it was doing is it was just stepping that bit further and further out 
in your property graph, right? And suggesting you more and more people. So with the shortest path, you might say, well, how, how, what is the journey it takes to get from me to somebody watching this if we're not connected on LinkedIn already, right? How many different people would we have to be referred to potentially before we would meet, okay? Another example might be transitive closure, which is the example we were talking about, right? Show me everybody one hop away, two hops away, three, four, five, six, right? Going deeper and deeper and deeper. And you imagine each time you go one layer out. So if I go from the person that I, from me to the people that I know, that might be a hundred people. And then each one of them may also know a hundred people, right? So we go much bigger. And each one of those now know each other. And our graph just gets so, so much bigger each step that we take. And then the last one is um, called polymorphism, and that is looking to find any node just connected to another, okay? How we can do that. Are two nodes connected? I don't care how they're connected. I don't want the shortest path. I just want to know, is there a physical connection between these two things? And taking these three examples, you can come up with some interesting use cases. So interesting use case number one um, is a social graph. Now, if you cast your mind back to when your smartphone wasn't so smart, um, what you typically used to do is you would have a normal phone um, and you'd be on a particular provider such as, uh, I don't know, uh, EE or Orange or whatever they used to be called, and you would have a plan with them. And on that plan, you might nominate 10 phone numbers that you got reduced phone calls for. And so if you made a call to that person, it was, you know, half the price or something. And what you would find is that through those connections, as you could see, that you would find uh, what's known as a kind of queen bee. And there would be somebody who was central to so many of these different connections that if that person left your network and went to a competitor, what you would see is you would slowly see all of those other people moving away to continue to get their cheap calls of that person. And so when you find those queen bees, they're the people that you want to keep. They're the people you want to market to and offer the best incentives for them to stay on your network. The same happens in social networks. The same happens in particular, you know, selling scenarios, recommendations. The stuff just, you know, appears in multiple different ways. Another one is fraud detection. Um, out of interest, if everybody can just pop into the chat if you commit fraud or not. That'd be great. Just wait. Not seen anybody yet. Okay, right. Fraud's quite difficult to detect. And there are many different ways in which you can connect, um, connect, um, detect fraud. One of those, and a really interesting way, is with graph based processing. So, fraud, kind of fraud rings, will typically create um, one, like a common process is people will create people kind of right so let's say you're applying for a, a bank overdraft you open a bank account um, and you want to apply for an overdraft now to create something that looks like a real person i might take someone's social security number someone's home address someone's um, records in another way their phone number and i'll use them all to construct what looks like a real person i'll open an account and I'll make check-ins, I'll look like a good, you know, customer. And then eventually I'll shut down the account and I'll well, I'll take all of the overdraft and I'll disappear. Right. And it's almost impossible for banks to recover that um, lost money. But what if we were able to say that we have seen a fraudulent transaction come up on a credit card? And then we track that credit card and find out that that credit card is actually associated to these two people. But actually, the social security number on those two people is also associated to these 10 people. And we start, you know, kind of pulling those threads to find out where else, you know, this kind of web of fake people is. And we can use that to potentially stop fraud. Recommendations. Recommendations are another great use for um, graph based processing. Recommendations typically work using a process known as triadic closure. I always think it sounds incredibly grand, triadic closure. Um, but all triadic closure means is basically making triangles. It's like you bought this book, somebody else bought this book. Do you two know each other? 
and you would kind of make that or your friends with Bob and Bob is friends with Sally. Are you also friends with Sally? Oh, well, yeah. OK, we'll just make a triangle. OK, so what triadic closure is suggesting where to close the triangles. OK. Last one is network IT, um, an interesting one as well. Maybe you've got all of your services load balance behind Cloudflare or one of these kind of services. What happens if you use lose one of the load balance Cloudflare servers? What does it do? How do we check the knock on effect? Graph based processing is a great option for it. Okay. So we've seen some of the high level options. We've seen some of the scenarios that it can solve. Now let's talk a little bit about graph frames and then let's dig in and have a look at a couple of examples, right? So graph frames are a way of doing property graphs built on top of Apache Spark. You can think of graph engines in a couple of different ways. You have persisted graph databases like TigerGraph, Neo4j, a load of different um, vendor tools that are out there. And then you have analytical graphs. These are graphs that are not persisted, that you reshape your data at runtime so you can query them in a particular way. And then either you choose to persist that graph or trash it at that time and then reload it. Okay. With Apache Spark, we have a more analytical graph way of working. So you don't get all the things you would with Neo4j, such as transactional consistency and these sorts of things, right? Now, this is built on top of Apache Spark. And one thing that we went through last time is we said Spark is like this core um, framework and it's got all these extensions. One of those extensions is Graph. Good thing to kind of um, remember is that we also have our, anything we're doing in Spark is very much related to a distribution. So when we're looking at processing our graph here, we're looking at processing on at scale using a distributed way of working, okay? And now the other core bit to remember as well is lots of core things to remember, everyone. Um, <laughs> this stuff, anything with distributions is like so many things to be aware of. But Spark has gone through so many changes over the last, gosh, it's 11 years now that Spark's been around. In particular, over the last five years, we've shifted away from working in a way known as RDDs, resilient distributed data sets, to a declarative way of working, which uses data frames. And one thing we touched on in the last session was there's Spark ML, um, sorry, there's ML Lib and there's Spark ML. And ML Lib looked at RDDs and Spark ML looked at data frames. For graph based processing, there's a very similar thing. There's GraphX, which is the old RDD way of working, and there are graph frames, which is the data frame way of working. Okay. It says up there, Graph frames are to data frames as graph X is to RDDs, right? So basically, just don't look at graph X, okay? It's too complicated. It's too low level. Um, it's too hard to get started with. Ignore that it's a thing and just focus on graph frames, okay? So let's have a look at a few bits, right? Okay, so I'm going to move over here. Now, this is Azure Databricks. If you've never looked at it before, and um, what you've got in here is a kind of multi-purpose uh, environment for working with Spark in Python, Scala, R, SQL, whole variety of different languages. Okay. And so what I've done is I've created um, a notebook here called Exploring Movie Data with Graph-Based Processing. Okay. And so the first thing that you've got up here is we've got an example here that says, right, a lot of these examples demonstrate a lot of the key information that comes from um, graph frames, the graph frame user guide. So if I hop up here, this graph frame user guide is a really useful place to get started when you're looking into graph-based processing. It'll take you through a kind of a lot of the things like breadth first search, things that we won't cover off today, but are good things to understand the difference between a breadth-based search compared to a depth-based search and what the implications are, how you stop in actually traversing a graph and what you want to do, okay? So it's a great place to start. Um, so 
I've got some data um, and I'm happy to share all of this stuff. As always, if you want these notebooks, um, I will pass them on. I've got some data here which uses um, some movie data. I'm just going to copy the URL um, as it seems to expire very quickly each time I run this notebook. And let's pop it in. So first things first, let's just run these two. What I'm going to do is I'm going to import a couple of libraries. I've got um, the my main kind of PySpark libraries, which I've got a whole load of things that I'm going to use for transforming my data. Then I've got this one from graph frames, import everything in there. And I'm also using pandas as well so that I can read that data from GitHub. Now, graph frames, it's worth calling out at this point that I'm using a cluster and the cluster I am using is using a runtime. OK, so this is Databricks' way of encapsulating your environment. And so this is using 10.2 ML, right? The ML part on here is quite important. If we hop over to um, the docs around what is included in 10.2 for ML, what you'll see if we scroll down um, is it will tell you about all of the packages that it supports. So you can see all of these different Python libraries are on here. A whole load of um, R libraries are on here as well. Different GPU configurations, loads and loads and loads, right? One of the things that come here, it says top tier libraries that are included are things like TensorFlow, Torch, MLflow, and then this guy, right? Graph frames, the one that we want. Again, you can kind of click through this stuff and get a little bit of documentation. The docs from Microsoft are nothing compared to the user guide. So kind of just use the two in combination. Um, but you don't need to install anything pretty much to get this to work, right? It's just part of the runtime um, and it's just using the latest version, okay? So we're all set up there. And we'll let that one come back. So we've read some data in. If we display that data, it looks a bit like this, OK? We've got a number of attributes here. I've got um, the director. I've got things like the duration of the film, um, whether it was in color or not, who the actors were. So this had a secondary actor of Orlando Bloom and a primary actor of Johnny Depp. It was action fantasy. If you didn't see it already, I can imagine it's Pirates of the Caribbean. It's made by Gore Verbinski. It's definitely Pirates of the Caribbean um, somewhere in there. We can see some of the plot keywords, goddess, marriage ceremony. I've gone to the wrong one. I don't know. Um, but you can see a whole load of interesting bits and pieces that are coming out the back of that. So this is data we're working with. And we might want to ask some interesting things around, you know, who are who are the most important actors that we have? How do we traverse between one actor to another by going through the films that they've had co-stars in? How do we look at which films we might want to recommend to someone based on the strength of films that they've seen before? We can start building out some of the ways of working um, using this data. So I'm going to use a combination of techniques in Databricks. I'm going to start off by using Hive. Now, Hive is a kind of abstraction database that is built into um, Databricks. Hive, which comes from um, the Hadoop way of working, and it gives us the ability to wrap a kind of metadata layer over an external table. And all that means is the data that I'm saving each time is written down to some disk somewhere and I'm just putting a kind of database over the top, right? It's not quite a database, but it's it's a, it's close enough to it. And so I've got this, this table here called movies data, and then I'm gonna just save that. So I'm saving that back down to disk. And by default in 10.2, that is gonna save in a Delta format, and it's gonna save it down into the Databricks file system which is actually just a blob storage account. Um, and it's just saving it there for now. Then I'm going to create a series of tables for genre, movie, actor, director. These are going to become my nodes. And I'm only I'm using this to kind of stage my data. 
And then I'm going to create a couple of additional tables here for acted in, for directed, so that I can start building out the relationships between these two, um, two kind of nodes, right? Um, I'm going to create a load of queries here to populate that. So essentially just shred that data down and put it into the format that I want. A lot of this stuff, we won't go through in too much detail, but I recommend you go and just have a look, step through it. One thing you'll see is I've decided to do most of these queries in Spark SQL. It just works, right? You could do it in Python. You could do it in Scala. Whatever you are most comfortable with, just do it in that language, okay? Um, so here we populate movies. So we just clean up the movie title and we create a movie ID. Now, the movie ID that I've used isn't part of the data. I've used something called a monotomically increasing ID. Now, if you think about adding, if you've got a database, right, and you add an identity column to it, each row you insert will have an, an incrementing number. So you'll have for your first row, one, two, three, or whatever you set it to. When you're working in a distribution, let's say you've got four different machines, it's very difficult to have a constantly incrementing number because your data may exist on any one of those four machines. So the way that Spark and most of big data has implemented the idea of having an incrementing ID is to have this idea of a monotomically increasing ID where we kind of just patch, we, we bucket up groups of numbers for each one of your nodes um, and we use those. So if you look at the IDs that get generated, we'll have some which are like one to a hundred, and then you have another one which is 800,000 to something, right? Because it's just kind of bucketed up what it thinks is a sensible amount of IDs that we could use. We create a genre table doing some funky stuff inside um, Spark, which does splits and explodes, which is how you split something and then put it over lots of rows, um, lots of fun stuff. We create a table for directors, and we've got um, just two, just shy of um, 2,400 directors. We do the same for actors. So actors is a bit more awkward because there's your primary, secondary, um, and third actor as well. And so we've got 6,000 actors. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to start creating our first edge. And our first edge is to go from person to movie. So we want to see here, I've got this one here, actor one, actor one acted in movie 181. And then you see the jump, right? This is that monotomically increasing ID. We've gone from 181 to 1719, duh, 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 right? Much bigger number. And if you scan, you'll see small number, big number, small number, big number. Um, that's all just because of the cluster. But this person, movie actor one, appeared in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven films. Okay. And those are the films that they appeared in. So this is our edge. Um, and then what we're going to do here is we're going to create our acted in. So I'm going to repeat this step here. This step kind of works for, this is actor three. I want a union, whether the primary actor, the secondary actor, or the third actor. So if you are the lead in one film and a support in another, we want to just count that as you were in that film. We don't really care what position you held in that film. And then what I'm going to do is because of the way that Spark creates graphs and graph frames, I'm going to start giving each one of my IDs a little bit of a helpful identifier. So I know this is a movie and this is an actor. Now, when you create a normal graph, what you'll do is you'll create a series of nodes and a series of edges and you'll build them all up. So you'll create like an array of edges, an array of nodes and say, this is my graph. Graph frames only supports the idea of having a node and an edge. And there are different types of edges and there are different nodes, but the way you build them all, they all have to be one construct, which is a really annoying way of working. And other implementations implement it much better. Near4j, TigerGraph, even Network X, a Python library implement this much better. But if you've got Spark and you've got graph frames, you may as well use them, okay? So we build these up. I build up another one for start, which is the other way around from acted. And we've got something that looks a bit like this. 
So now what we want to do is we want to create our nodes and our edges, and we want to build out a graph. So I'm going to just union these things together, which is my acted in and my starred, or it could be my acted in and my directed, financed, whatever I'm doing. And I build up um, a load of calculations between one node and another. And I do the similar thing here as well um, for, so these are, these are all of my nodes and these ones are my edges. So you can see here, um, 13A, which was an actor, acted in this particular movie. And the relationship was an acted in relationship. And so what I do is I construct that all together and I make two queries here, my vertices, my nodes, and my edges. And then all I do is I say, I would like you to create me a graph using these vertices and these edges, okay? And then it will go away and actually reshape that data and construct that graph for us. Um, and so if we get rid of that one, um, it says here, if you print this graph right, this is a graph frame of these vertices and these edges. Now we can start doing some calculations with this and start seeing what we have. So I'm gonna run this query. I'm gonna start with my G here, which is my graph. And I'm gonna say, go along my edges. And I want you to filter the relationship to be that acted in one, which we built up here. And I want to know how many acted in relationships there are in this graph. And it says there are, what, um, there are, 15,000, right? And that is pretty much because we've got like 5,000 rows in the data and there's like three for each um, each primary, secondary and third. So you get a few more and we distinct them as well. Um, and you end up with 15,000 people. Now, the way that graph processing kind of works is it implements querying in a slightly different way. So where you might be used to in say something like SQL, where you would write select star from yada, yada, yada. Here, what we're doing is we're using this idea, which is called a motif based search or an ASCII based search either way. And the way that it works is it works like this. All right. So you would say in my graph, I would like you to find, and it builds out this kind of structure where you've got a, through E to B. Now, what A and B are, are two nodes, okay? And E represents the edge in the middle. So it is saying, just start somewhere and go one connection and bring me back all of the nodes, okay? And so what that ends up looking like is something like this. So you can see here, Robin Williams acted in the movie Night at the Museum. Good movie, right? Or we could see, um, what's another one here? First Night. First Night starred Julia Orman, okay? So we're hopping through that relationship. Now, I'm not having to say these are the tables. This is how they're joined. The joins and the relationships are implicit, or sorry, they are explicit in this structure. It is just part of now. Our graph has this baked into it. Now, I could go a little bit deeper. What I could say is I want you to actually say, go from here. And I want you to show me every film that starred. So start at a person and go through a film and show me that person. But then also show me that person that also was in the same film, OK? And I think because of my starred in, I might break this a little bit. Um, too many long bits in there. But what you end up with is you can see that Robin Williams acted in Night at the Museum. And it's going to say Night at the Museum also starred. So it's not quite a good way to do it what we should have had is kind of like a directed relationship. And then you would be able to see who was the director in a film that also starred in that film. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. Everybody loves a film with 50 Cent in, right? Add your comments in. What's your favorite 50 Cent film? We all know it's Get Rich or Die Trying, right? We could run a query like this. Find me all films that star 50 Cent. 
in a sequel way that looks like this. Select movie title where the actor one is 50 cent or 50 cent or 50 cent. That's one way of doing it, yeah? Another way of doing it would be to say something like this. What I want you to do is I want this to be my motif. I want you to go from actor to movie based on the actor being 50 cent, okay? And so what we see here is we'll see 50 Cent was in five, thil five films. And those five films are A Righteous Kill, Southpaw. Southpaw's a great film. Escape Plan, not so great. No idea what that is. And then the star of the show, right? I, I don't think I've actually seen that film. Um, but you get the idea, right? A sequel way of work writing this compared with the graph way of writing this. Now, I've only got a limited amount of character right, keys that I can do in my lifetime. There's that horrible website you can go on where it works out your typing speed and how long you've got left to live and how many characters you can type. If you really want to get morbid, have a look at it. But I want to write things in the most concise way possible. And so that's one way. Now, what if I wanted to do something like our example where we were saying, I want to go a level out in my graph. I want to find all the films which starred 50 Cent and then find all of the actors who were also in those films, right? So you think about it. I'm, I'm 50 Cent and then I'm going into the films that 50 Cent was in and then I'm looking at all of the actors, so one layer out, who were in those films. So we're going to go from one to five to however many then at that point, 25, depending on if there's overlapping actors. To do that in SQL, oh, this starts getting a bit complicated. You're needing to do things as inner joins. We're having to make subqueries and then calculate them out. It's starting to get a bit complicated. And the reason also why this starts to become a problem is relational databases aren't geared up for this. Relational databases will just, as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, the amount of records you find will just kind of exponentially increase with the numbers that you have. And where that happens, there was a study, gosh, a few years back now by Nia Fajay, which looked at the depth of your search. And on a relational database and a graph database, at a depth of two, they performed almost exactly the same. And at a depth of three, the graph database returned a query in like a millisecond, a few milliseconds. And the relational database took like a second. And as you went deeper and deeper, by the time they got to five or six, the graph database would take a consistent amount of time, a few seconds to return that query. And the relational database, they gave up like a day, beyond a day it would take just because the complexity of going find one set to then find the next set to then find the next set, it's just not designed for it, right? So if we want to do that here, we could say, I want to start with actor one to um, movie, and then I go movie to actors, but I'm only interested in 50 cent, and I'm not interested in finding 50 cent back, right? I'm not interested in the movies that also had 50 cent in them. And we can see that we had 10 records up here, and we had 10 records down here. Hey, I'm going to go deeper again, right? Now I want to find all the movies that they were in. And so all I need to do is keep const just like constructing these um, ways of working. And I get the same thing back again. I've not tried to do that in SQL because it would be a huge query and it'd be really annoying to write. But here it's just an additional little property. And now I can see 166 films that were the films that, you know, every film that Jake Gyllenhaal was in, Billy Duke, Al Pacino, Bruce Willis, etc. right? All of these people were then in these films. We can go deeper, right? You get the idea. Now we're up to 281. And now if this was a site like a social network and we were looking at people's friends um, and not something that required massive multi-million pound, you know, movies to be produced, these numbers would get like large really, really quickly. So um, this kind of way of working can be really useful. Now, it's not all about ASCII ways of working, right? There are different things that we can do. If you have a look at the user guide here, you'll see some of the kind of common things that you might want to do in a graph. 
you might want to do that um, that breadth search here. You might want to look at strongly connected components. You might want to look at things like page rank. Page rank being from um, from the internet, looking at which connections in your in your graph are the most important, and that could be this person was in the most amount of movies. This person, you know, starred in the most things. This person also directed lots. Like, who are the key players? Who are our queen bees, essentially, right? You might want to find the shortest path. You might want to find triangles to do our triadic closure, okay? Plus a whole load of other bits and pieces. So let's look at page rank. What we can do is we can just say, G, page rank, um, and then set some probabilities and tolerances, which you can read about um, in the um, on that guide. And what that will do is it will produce this. So it will give you this um, back and it will show you for every actor, what is their page rank? So for somebody here like Ashley Scott, they have a lower page rank than um, Udu Kier. And if we order by page rank, there you go, what you'll start seeing unsurprisingly are very popular actors, right? Old Bobby Nero um, appears in lots. Johnny Depp does. If you look also at who appeared in the most films, it's one of these two. If you look at the highest grossing um, films and you sum them up, it's one of these two. Already, just by looking at this, looking at something very basic, we're able to start seeing interesting things um, appear. So PageRank could be used for finding, you know, those customers who are really important to you through those connections or those products that particularly sell well or that everybody owns that you might just make well they're easy recommendations to push on to someone else shortest path we could say what is the shortest path between this actor and this movie which i think was jason gordon levitt and blade runner <laughs> were the two that i selected um, and what you'll see here is a picture that's not the easiest to understand but what it is, is it's showing you every possible combination to go between those two. Um, and where you've got something very highly connected, you can it can be very you can end up with lots. And so this is where you end up with breadth based searching and depth based searching, which optimize will optimize what's the quickest way. Do you want to look at everything or do you want to just find whichever one is going to return you the fastest? OK. Um, and then we might say, I want to look at the shortest path between um, two things. That's what we just looked at. And the last one being um, triadic closure. I want to find how many triangles there are. And apparently there are no triangles in my data, which I do not believe. So I think that's probably something that I've done wrong. But there are a couple of examples of different things that you might want to do using that kind of graph based structure. So going back to slides to finish us off. And I think I'm just about on time. So what I would say to finish off right is Apache Spark is great for many analytical tasks. And where you've got highly connected data, Spark can be a really good option for giving you that analytical, analytical PRAF there or graph, if I, if I wrote it correctly. But where you need a persisted graph, um, other tools such as Neo, Tiger Graph, some of the other key vendors um, are going to be better. Azure Cosmos DB is the implementation of um, Azure Cosmos DB implement the best named graph database of them all, which if you ever say in front of a customer or your colleagues um, that you're implementing Apache Tinkerpop um, and that we're going to query it with Gremlin, Everyone looks at you like, what on earth are you talking about? Um, but the, it's a it's a phenomenal tool, uh, regardless. And Tinkerpop is just a great thing to say. Um, but those tools are better if you need a persisted graph. But if you need something to just spin up to do analytics on at scale as well, because you've got so much data, Apache Spark is a great place to look. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And if you do have any questions, um, drop them in the chat. Love to go through them all. My contact details are there. Do get in touch um, if you've got any questions or any stumbling blocks. 
check out the YouTube as well, because there's some good theory, um, short theory videos where we go into some of these concepts in a lot more detail. Um, and yeah, give me a shout if you want to know about some real world applications and how you can use graph based processing to solve real problems. Um, thanks very much. Well, Terry, thank you so much. It was really exciting to hear about uh, graph-based analytics it was, and, and it was really nicely understandable and, and all that. And, and I think it was really interesting to, to hear about this approach. And it's, it's quite important as well when it comes to have a good understanding of data. So it was really interesting. Thank you so much. You are welcome. And we have some questions actually um for example this one so is it possible to store metadata in a graph database yes so metadata typically typically will be some kind of combination of properties um but it may also just be attributes about a node so it could be like we take the example again of movies right our whole movie node was just the movie and was just the id and the name but you could have also added in there what was the total grossing um, revenue, what was the budget, um, who was the production studio, all of the other key bits of information that you would typically want to then be able to store. The other way of doing that is you could actually just store for the, like basically everything you put in a graph slows your graph down, okay? Unless it's useful for what you're trying to do, like leave it out. But what you can do and is a very kind of common pattern is you'll bake whatever you need into a graph, you'll make your queries, and then you'll look at the output of that and kind of just bring it back in the context of the rest of your data. So you might use the graph to generate the responses and then use the rest of your data to convert that back into that meaningful metadata and the rest of the attributes. You could do either really. Um, and But keeping a graph as succinct as possible just hopefully eliminates crazy long running queries because it's um it's very easy to get stuck in in never ending loops in graph databases yes thank you terry for the great answer and for the great question as well <laughs> so and we have another one from gabriel as well which i think it's important to discuss as well to see any recommendation where to start learning databricks and PySpark from the beginning yes yeah um, so I would say at, at this point, looking at Spark is just generally a great option for everybody. There was a Stack Overflow survey at the end of last year. And in that, they ask everybody um, about what skills they have and how much money they get paid. And then they try to work out a kind of monetary value for each framework that you know and each skill you have. And the highest kind of net yielding skill that you could have was Apache Spark in the last survey um, for data, that is. Nice. So, so learning Spark basically will make you more money is the, is the theory. <laughs> Where to start? Yes. There are tons of great resources. Databricks have got a load. We've got loads. So we've got like 150 videos on our YouTube channel. Um, I, I would recommend, you know, I always recommend YouTube as a great place to start. But also have a look at Databricks. Databricks have a thing called the Community Edition. It's a free to use version of their, um, of their software. You can just, it's, it technically runs in AWS, but you don't need an AWS account or anything. And you can try all of the examples that we run through. They'll just work there and they'll work pretty well. Thank you, Terry. And we, I think we will also share your previous session at AI42 because that was Perfect. also a really good intro to, to Databricks itself and to Spark. So I think that's a good idea also to share in the comments in a sec. And also to that, you also have this uh, podcast called Data Science in Production. Yep. And I assume you have a lot of nice content there as well for those who would like to learn more. Yeah, yeah. So for anybody who uh, struggles with getting things live, um, I often think that people often say, you know, the hardest, the hardest thing of machine learning is picking which framework. But for a lot of people, the hardest part of machine learning is actually getting something live and offering an ROI. So what the podcast is there is essentially there to try to help people understand what they need to do. Um, so yeah, please check it out. We'll share those links in the chat in a moment. 
And uh, with that, again, thank you, Terry, for this great session. I enjoyed a lot uh, the way you are talking about these things. It's uh, easier to understand with this kind of flow <laughs> that you're good, making here. Good stuff. Yeah, it's, so, a lot of, it's a lot of fun. I think anything that's rooted in a lot of theory, um, like all of it, you look at like graph theory, Spark, there's so much like kind of like academic backing to it. And anywhere there's that, I love that stuff. It's just, yes. it's just good fun. <laughs> We also enjoyed it a lot. I mean, at least me personally enjoyed it very much. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and please, those who you would like to continue your journey from here, please remember to, to check out our YouTube channel as well, where you can find a lot of uh, information already about how to get started with AI. So you can hear about uh, how to get a good understanding about uh, mathematics, the statistical thinking, and all the uh, data science stuff, and all this is there already. And you can also find a Terry session there about Databricks, but there are a lot more about Azure Machine Learning as well, and more is coming in the coming weeks. Uh, can we bring up the slide so I can show around a little more? Thank you. So next time we are coming back on the on the 9th of February with Hank, who we're going to talk about how to set up Azure Machine Learning Pipelines. This is going to be also interesting because there you could learn how to automate your um, machine learning solutions. Then um, with that, I want to say thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, and uh, please also remember, if you would like to be a speaker at AI42, just uh, push your uh, uh, papers into our call for speaker page, which you can see on here. And uh, also, we would like to say thank you in the name of the whole team, I guess. Yes, that's not next. Yes. <laughs> so thank you, Gosha and Hank, for all the background work you're doing for us. And uh, Terry, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Yes. And the audience, thank you again for, for joining us today. Uh, it was a great session. Again, I hope you enjoyed yourself and see you again next time.